Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome today to our webinar on the topic of Are Granny Flats a Good Investment? I'm Rich Harvey, CEO of Property Buyer. And today I have with me Wally Gabriel. Uh, Wally, thanks for joining us. Wally is the Director and Design Manager of Granny Flat Solutions, a fantastic company uh, based in Sydney. Wally um, has a background in architecture. He uh, loves turning creative ideas into high quality dwellings and uh, has been a, a great promoter of the whole Granny Flat concept. So great to have you on board today, Wally. And uh, Thanks, love to throw to you and if you'd like to share your screen and uh, yeah, get started with our introduction, sure. um, that'd be great. Mm. Alrighty. Just while you're setting that up too, I just to let everyone know, yeah, a copy of the, uh, the slides and the recording will be sent to everyone who's registered today. All right, you can see that? Absolutely, mate. All good to go. Excellent. So, guys, yeah, thank you for joining. Um, as Rich mentioned, my name is Wally Gabriel, Director of Granny Flat Solutions. I'm uh, very excited to be here and present to you guys today, and I uh, hope you take away some good learnings from it. Um, this isn't a sales pitch at all. It's just purely educational. Um, and like I said, hopefully there's some great um, learnings from it. We are a Sydney-based company, so the information I'm presenting is probably more uh, applicable to Sydney. But there are a few slides in there as well in relation to other states. So let's get started. All right. So where can you build granny flats? Um, look, generally in New South Wales, uh, the rules are that you can build, um, uh, sorry, yeah, uh, pretty much behind, in front, beside, even on top of the main dwelling. Uh, they're all permissible, but there are different rules in relation to setbacks. And that's probably the key thing here because, um, you know, if you were to build in front of the main house, um, whilst it's permissible, they look at the adjoining houses either side and they look at the average setbacks of all those homes as well. So whilst it's permissible, it's not going to be suitable to every block. Uh, also, um, being permissible doesn't always guarantee that you can build there. Certain councils have certain restrictions or limitations, like, for example, if you're in a bushfire zone, flood zone, heritage conservation or environmental zone doesn't always uh, prohibit you from building, but there will be further works or investigations or reports that you need to look into and stuff that we do on a daily basis just to confirm whether you can build or not. We'll have a look at some of the council rules and restrictions. So look, in New South Wales, there are two ways you can get a granny flat approved. You've got the traditional, me the traditional method, which is your DA and your construction certificate process. That's where you lodge a DA, go through council. That can take you know, who knows, two months, three months, depending on the complexity of it, six months, and you're within the realms of council, neighbours get notified, there are so many things that, or, you know, outside forces that could um, influence the approval. The second option is your compliant development process, which is faster and cheaper. And it's pretty much like a checklist approval process, as long as you meet all the minimum requirements. Um, and there's a table there with a bit of a summary. And that's the name of the legislation there. So it's State Environmental Planning Policy, the Housing 2021. So if I look at any one of those, let's just say 600 to 900 square metre block there. Uh, the minimum frontage requirement is 12 metres, 50% site coverage, um, total floor area of the house, the granny flat, and all other structures, 380 square metres. Then it goes on to talk about your front setbacks, side setbacks, rear setbacks, and your landscaping requirements. So I may just rush rushing through them, but... That's sort of the the matrix we use internally just to sort of do our first preliminary check, make sure if something can be approved on that property, just using that table there. So Wally, just a quick question. If if a property on a, say, a six to 900 square metre site has already got 400 square metres of building on it, you're saying basically you can't build a granny flat if it's already got a total floor area of 400? Um, look, under a CDC, yes, the answer is yes, you can't. Um, because you're going to be over that 380 square meter requirement there. Hmm. Uh, however, you can still try to go through council. So they do use two different planning policies. Councils have their own policies, and the CDC is, is sort of a, a statewide policy which applies yep. everywhere. So if you're not meeting the CDC requirement, then we try to go through council. Um, council is not a guaranteed approval process like the compliant development process is, hmm. but you can try. Yep. You can try it. Right. Speaking of councils, um, like I just mentioned before, if you don't meet those minimum requirements, which are stipulated in the, in the planning policy, then you can try going through council. Um, and like I mentioned, it, it is a longer process. They do notify neighbours. Neighbours have the right to object. In fact, they're given an opportunity to object. Um, 
that doesn't always mean that they're going to listen to neighbours, but that that can slow down the process when you do get a lot of neighbours objecting to it. Um, some councils do have their own policies, and I've just brought up one council there being Kuringa Council. Uh, they basically say that you can build a, a granny flat that's up to 25% of the floor of the existing dwelling as long as you meet all their requirements. So that's very different to that table I showed before. This is if you go through council and we apply their planning policies. Uh, likewise, Hornsby Council, if you're in a rural area, they've got a specific policy that allows you to build granny flats up to 120 square metres in size on rural properties. So sometimes going through council, it does, you know, a lot of people get deterred by or they're scared going through council. We'll often do an assessment. We prefer to go through CDC because you're dealing, you know, as I said before, like a checklist approval process, so much quicker, so much easier. You know what you're dealing with. There's no gray areas. It's not subjective. It's purely based on on numbers. Uh, whereas when you go through council, there are uh, there, there are there are risks, but in some cases, like this one I mentioned in Kuring Guide, you might end up, and we've done it multiple times, we've ended up with green flats that are 80, 90 square metres in size, and that's all been approved by council. So going through the CDC process, um, there is a misconception. We hear it a lot. People think that because it's a CDC, you don't need approvals. Um, that's not correct. You still do need to get approvals, but it's done through a private certification process rather than through council. You still need the same amount of documentation that you would need if you were to go to council. So you still need to engage all the consultants, your surveyors, a designer, stormwater engineer, structural engineer, basics consultant, sewer approvals, uh, estimator, builder, and a private certifier as well. And then you submit the application or to the private certifier. Um, and they, again, like I said before, like a checklist, they go through the, every single one of the items and I've got a, a list of them there. So as long as you meet all the criteria there being, you know, the site area, block width, the floor area, the setbacks, landscaping, site coverage, then they're basically going to approve this development. The other thing as well is people often think that going through a CDC or going through a private certifier is um, not so much illegal, but they think it's just not right and they're worried that it's not legal. Um, just be just rest assured that certifiers, once they do approve something, they submit all the paperwork to council as well. So anything that's approved, whether it's by council or a certifier, is um, archived with council. So if you were to sell the property or inquire about it, they would still have records of the approval. So there's nothing... Um, untowards happening there. With a CDC, again, we say it takes about two to three months to get an approval. If you look on the, um, the state planning policy, they talk about a 14-day approval process. That's basically the time it takes for the certifier to approve it after they've received all the documentation. So I say there it takes about two to three months because there's a fair bit of, like I mentioned that first paragraph there, fair bit of documentation and drawings and so on that goes on to get it ready and then you submit it um, and uh, like I mentioned at the bottom there as well, some projects are a bit more complicated than others um, where we have to engage additional consultants, acoustic consultants, bushfire, flooding, and so on. Those process, projects can take a bit longer. Okay, so let's look at some opportunities for development. In um, October last year, CoreLogic, Archistar, and Blackfort did a, a, a study on granny flats in three states. It was Sydney, Melbourne, and Brisbane. And I'll share some of that data with you. It's quite interesting, actually. So don't know how clear that is, but basically the they identified 242,000 properties across the Sydney metropolitan area that was suitable for granny flats. And that's 17% of all the properties across the Sydney metropolitan area, um, which is quite a staggering number. Um, and that's just based using all their metrics and, and data and programs they use. Um, and that was interesting because that triggered a lot of uh, media coverage and, and you know, people started to ask me, so oh, is my property suitable and so on. So there is still a lot of opportunities in Sydney. In Melbourne, 229,000 properties were suitable for granny flats. And again, that's based on 13.2% 13 of all properties in the metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. There are some other data down there in terms of location to railway stations and whatnot but, um, and close to hospitals as well. And then finally in Brisbane, it was 184,660 properties representing 23% of all properties in the um, metropolitan area. That's quite a big number, isn't it, Wally? Like it's pretty decent, isn't it? Like in all, all, all cities, there's still a significant number that could do granny flats. Yeah, absolutely. Like 184,000. So that rules out, you know, your, um, your residential flat buildings and those sites which are it doesn't just look at every single site. It looks at sites that are actually suitable. So it looks at the R2 zonings and, mm. and everything else. But yeah, that's still a staggering, staggering high number. Mm. That's great. 
Well, look at some of the pros and cons of building a granny flat. So I guess the biggest pro, and we'll go into pricing uh, shortly, but I often say to people, where can you buy a brand new apartment anywhere in Sydney for from 140000 And mm-hmm. it's just, it's impossible. You can't buy a house, you can't buy an apartment, you can't buy anything for that sort of money. So buying a granny flat or building a granny flat, they do start at 141000 You're getting a brand new two-bedroom home for that price. So there are definitely some advantages there. And it's a great accommodation option for, you know, young adults, newlyweds, elderly people, downsizing opportunities. Um, people use them as home offices, hobby rooms, and just, you know, excellent investment opportunities as well, which we'll go into shortly. But it's also bricks and mortar. So when you're building a grain flat on your property, you're you're adding to the value of the property. You're building a a structure that's part of it. So when you sell it, you're, you're selling it with a physical structure on there. So it's not... Um, I know nothing about shares or anything else, but you're not you're not uh, risking things. You're actually building bricks and mortar on a residential property. So there are lots of opportunities and pros in doing that. And like I said, we'll go into costing and the ROIs shortly. I guess the biggest con that I see is, you know, we talk about the minimum block size being 450 square metres to fit a grain flat. But just because you have that 450, there are some blocks which I often say is still not suitable because... They've got really small backyards. They're, they're trying to squeeze one in. And whilst they might meet all the criteria and meet the setbacks and the landscaping ratios and whatnot, I've often seen cases where the granny flat is so close to the main house that, you know, if you if you were living in the main house or even if it was rented out to somebody else, you walk out your back door and then there's this overwhelming structure in your backyard. To me, I feel that's, again, I find it a bit overwhelming, overdevelopment of the site. And to me, that could actually have a negative impact on the selling selling. If you were living there yourself with your family, you didn't care, that could be okay. Um, and we have had cases where they've actually asked us to build it close to the main house and have a big sliding door that opens on or faces the main house because they really wanted to share it with the family. So look, in cases like that, it could be a great opportunity, it could be more of a pro, um, but in some cases that could that could deter some people. So whether they detract or add value, so as I mentioned before, um, most people, so so basically, when you when you build a granny flat, if you were to come and sell that property the very next day after it was complete, you would always get your money back for what you've spent. So you spent one hundred fifty thousand dollars, one hundred forty thousand, whatever the number is, you're guaranteed to get that number back. But the people investors these days are not really um, building granny flats as an opportunity just to, um, you know, spend one hundred forty thousand dollars and sell it tomorrow. They're looking at this as as number one growing their uh, property portfolio, but also to maximize the yield on the property, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, so we have a design team here. We're always looking at maximizing the resale value of the house or looking at that, particularly when they're designing the granny flat. So they're trying to uh, design something that's going to fit, um, not, not just fit on the block, but also the aesthetics of it. Um, feel like it's meant to be there, not as an afterthought. Um, and like I mentioned before, if it does clash, you get to, you know different building materials sometimes or, you know, really nice modern house and a weatherboard type structure. Again, that could be suitable for some people, but times like that, it could be a, it could uh, almost have a negative impact on the property. But from all the data that we've seen, and and again, Rich, maybe you can elaborate on this whether it's now or later, but from what we've seen, every time you know, all the properties that we see for sale, and, and we do often look in different in different locations just to sort of see what the, what's happening in the market. You tend to see properties for sale, similar properties, one with and one without a granny flat. And you can always see the property, what the asking price is, is always that at least one fifty to $200,000 more. And in some cases, a lot more. And you can, I can put that down to almost being the fact that there is a grain flat on there. So mm. they are, they're not losing out. Yeah. Well, I'll just, I mean, I'm jumping ahead to one of my slides, Wally, but to, to hit this point on the head, absolutely. Um, some people used to say that if you're spending 150 or 200 plus on a granny flat, that you're not going to make it back. Um, that's completely a myth. That's completely wrong. We're finding now, and I've seen it for the last five years, that in fact, um, the equity value you increase from putting on a granny flat will increase more than the construction cost, somewhere anywhere from 10 to 15% more. Um, and in fact, you know, a couple of agents even emailed me about this, this presentation today saying, yeah, we, we totally agree. They're seeing it, but there's very high demand for people that want granny flats to either rent out for extra income um, or to get a dual investment property. Yeah, no, definitely. Mm-hmm. All righty. So let's look at some design trends. I think what's 
you know, what, what, what people ask for. And again, we've taken a lot of this um, based on our experience and knowledge. First of all, a lot of people ask, well, I save money if I build a one bedroom granny flat. And the honest truth is the cost difference between a one and a two bedroom granny flat is so, so small. Like you've still got all your site costs. You've still got a bathroom, a kitchen. You still got to connect all your services in the same way that you would, whether it was one or two bedroom. What you might save on is a little bit less concrete, one less wall, maybe a smaller roof area. But the cost difference between one and two bedrooms is so small. So typically two bedroom granny flats are the way to go. And the most common trends that we see are, for example, a lot of people do ask for one larger bedroom, one smaller one. Um, and, and there's two reasons for well, there's a few reasons, but often if, if they're going to occupy it themselves, they may just be a you know a small family or a couple. They love to have that extra storage space or a home office. But even families who are investing in a grand flat for rent for for investment purposes in the backyard, they'll often say, we just want one bi- one big room, one smaller room, so that they're not going to attract large families, particularly if they're living at the front. So by having the one bedroom, you're going to attract a single person, maybe a couple, and nothing more than that. Um, so yeah, so some people do ask for it for that reason as well. Study nook. So yeah, we're getting an overwhelming number of people asking for somehow incorporating a little study nook, a little workbench where they can work from home, set up a laptop. So that's something we've started to do more and more of. Um, adding our frescoes is has always been a um, bit of a selling point, but an opportunity, I guess, to open up your indoor outdoor space, connect them be undercover because living in a grand flat, I mean, if you've got a lot of people living in their, their spaces, but you're still confined into 60 square meters. So having that large sliding door open onto an alfresco just gives an opportunity to make it feel bigger and have indoor outdoor connectivity. And then um, other things people ask for is adding, you know, carports and garages attached to a granny flat. Um, look, if you've got a driveway that leads from the street all the way to the backyard, you can add a garage. It's always a bonus. You will rent it out for more money. And you've also got people that uh, love the opportunity that can just drive straight in from the street rather than parking on the road and walking up beside the main house. Um, they can just drive straight up, drive into their garage and they're inside. So they're probably the most, the four most common things that people ask for and that we've seen uh, push towards over the last few years. Can you build a green flat above a garage? Um, the answer is yes, you can. However, there are things that you need to consider when doing that. Um, if you are building on top of an existing structure, you really need to have a look at what's there at the moment and can it hold the weight of a, a second story above. So often that means you're, you know, taking out some, you're obviously taking off the roof, you're adding in some structural beams, columns, posts and whatnot. So that can um, add a lot of cost. And the other thing as well, and you know, this photo is a bit cut off there, but if you look to the left of the photo there, you can sort of see how the green flat is sort of stepped in uh, from the garage, which sits a bit further to the left below. And that's because the setbacks for a granny flat on the first floor are often greater than that of the granny of the garage on the lower floor. So I've written in there in that second paragraph that typically a side setback would be about two to two and a half meters off a boundary, whereas a garage would be typically one meter or 900 millimeters off the side boundary. So it will step in. Uh, the rear setbacks is a bit of a killer. So again, a typical, if it was just a garage on its own, you could go as close as one or one and a half meters of the back fence. Um, and a granny flat is typically at least three meters off the back fence. But when you put the granny flat above the garage, because of the height, there's like a formula that gets the formula they use to calculate the height of the building. Because of that, it actually pushes the rear set back to eight meters. So you're going to, have, to have a lot of space in your backyard to, to fit a two-story granny flat in there. Often it's probably um, cheaper to knock down the garage and build above it if, if the space permits. Or if you are in a laneway, it is quite common to to have a garage with a studio apartment on top of it as well. Okay, so um, this is data. This is our own data. This is based on I've taken all this data from two thousand twenty one till now. Um, we've worked at sixty percent of our customers are building for investment purposes, twenty five percent for family, and with family, it could be a range of things and. Like often, well, this is what I find often, people come in saying, oh, I just want to build a brand flat for the kids or for mum and dad or for elderly parents, whoever it may be. Um, often I find that by the time it's built, the, the occupiers of the main house decide that they want to live in the granny flat and leave the house to to the kids instead. Uh, I guess because it's brand new and it's they've spent money on it, they, they get excited by it, so they end up moving into it and leaving the, 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 the front house for the main for the rest of the family. But you know, either way, it's about twenty five percent of the projects are for family purposes. 
eight percent for both. So again, a lot of people will say, "Look, I'll rent it out for a few years until we need it, and then we'll move into it." And again, vice versa. We have people think they need it for short term purposes, and they'll rent it out later. And then seventy percent did not necessarily specify. Perhaps we didn't ask, but um, not quite sure. But you can sort of see there that overwhelmingly a large number of people are building grain flats for investment purposes. Okay, average cost. So in Sydney, uh, the grain flats start from 141200 and that includes all the design approval costs and GST as well. However, it's very, very important to understand or to note this. That's just a starting price. So it's very hard. It's not like a commodity that you buy off the shelf that you, you know, or you go to two BMW dealers, you see the exact same um, car, you ask them both to give you a quote and try to get the best deal. When you're, we, these are not prefabricated buildings. So we custom design and build to suit the site. So it's very hard for us to give fixed prices. So what we say is our starting price is 141,000. We then go have a look at the block itself and then we'll be able to identify if there are any uh, obstacles, hazards, or reasons why the site costs could, could increase significantly. And I often say this as well, and we have, we've actually built two almost identical granny flats on two blocks for the one customer next to each other. And one of them actually cost about, I can't remember the exact number, but it was close to about $15,000 more than the other one. And that was purely based on the fact that the other block was sloping a lot more. It had a sewer running through the back corner. And just those two things alone meant we needed more concrete, higher drop edge beams and encasing part of the sewer as well. So the grand flat cost might still be 141, 200, but then the site cost that you got to consider as well can sort of um, increase that. Other things we look at is the site access. We've obviously got to bring machines through to the back. We've got deliveries of materials. Um, and we need to understand where the services are for, uh, for your, your water, your gas, electricity, and so on. So, you know, if all your services are at the front of the main house and we're building in the backyard, we need to find a way to dig a trench from the back all the way to the front to run all our services, you know, your your PVC pipes, um, electrical, water, and so on. So these are all types of things that um, are hard to factor into a base price. Our base price of 141200 does have um, basic inclusions. And what I mean by that is, for, for example, services and dropage beams, we basically say we've allowed up to eight metres of service connections in our standard price. So it doesn't always mean that as soon as we come to the site, it's going to be more cost. It means we've allowed eight metres. And then when we go visit the site before we start, we'll be able to tell you how many metres there is and work out there's an additional cost for that. Likewise, we assume that if the block has a slope of less than half a metre, then our, our standard drop edge beam costs are included in that. If it starts to slope a little bit more, then those prices could go up. So I often tell people um, realistically, and I base this again just on data from projects we've been building, I say that could fall anywhere from about one hundred fifty to $220,000 as a general rule of thumb. Um, and that's factoring in, you know, as I said, site costs, um, access issues. And, you know, often people upgrade things. People might want to add, um, I don't know, um, additional air conditioner or additional bathroom or whatever the case may be. So all of those sort of things uh, get into there. But if you are looking at financing this or trying to get an indication, we do go out there, first of all, give you a quote and we'll factor in all of those things. But that's the sort of price range where I think you could be very comfortable in saying if you were trying to, I work out your finances, what you need to borrow. That's sort of a general uh, rule of thumb I often apply. Outside of Sydney, those prices will go up. So site costs are the same price, really. It's just the base price. Like in areas like Central Coast, Wollongong, um, further down sort of Nowra, further south and, and so on, they tend to attract a bit more of a loading just based on their location. But that guide there, 150 to 220, is, is generally a, a, a good rule of thumb. Okay, return on investment um, and, and property yield. So I love this stuff, so just bear with me. Um, I base this on an investment cost of 141200 Now, as I mentioned before, I know that cost could be 150 anywhere up to 200 plus, but I just use that number because that's sort of a general number we always start with. And we've got data to show as an average $550 per week um, anywhere from, and again, every location is different. And Rich, you'd know this, that, you, know, you can rent out granny flats in, in sort of Blacktown or Western Suburbs for about three fifty a week, three sixty a week, and we've seen areas around the northern beaches of Sydney which are getting seven eight hundred dollars a week. So we sort of looked at it everywhere from sort of the Western Suburbs and northern beaches, and we've come up with that five hundred fifty dollar per week um, as sort of an average in Sydney. 
um, which returns $28,600 per year. That's just purely based on the $550 a week in rental return. And the yield on that is 20%. Now, as an investment strategy, you could buy a house for a million dollars. You'd be, get $800 a week, $1,000 a week. If you're lucky, maybe more. Your rental return, your, your yield there is probably going to be close to about 6%. Um, so just on that alone, just the investment on purchasing or building a granny flat alone is around the 20%. Now, of course, if that number goes up from 140 to 150 or 160 and you still apply that 550 per week, you might get less per year. But I've still, personally, I've still never seen returns less than 15, 16%. So even on, in areas where um, the rental return might be less, the returns are still significant. Okay, these are real numbers. These are not made up or fabricated. We base this purely on, on the Sydney rental market. This is a bit of calculator we often use when we're educating people about um, um, yeah, the costs and whatnot. And if you are borrowing money, so this is a sort of an average number as well, based on $141,000 loan, uh, 6%. Um, your repayments, uh, renting about about $539 per week, roughly. We've worked out when you use this calculator, it shows you that in six years, you could pay off that $141,000 investment. Now, there is an online calculator that we use and happy to share that. And then later on, you can obviously add in different interest rates, number of years. In fact, most banks have their own calculators as well. You can enter in how much money you want to borrow um, and, and yeah, how many years you want to pay it off in and your frequency of repayments. But that's a pretty good one there. And I love using this. Six years, six years to pay off your, your loan. And then from that point on, it's a passive income moving forward. So now let's look at, a, and again, an average $700,000 mortgage. Uh, if you were to use that $539 you receive purely from the granny flat rental, is not taken into consideration the existing house that could be rented, you could be getting more. But basically, if you were to do that, $700,000 investment over a 30-year term, which is quite common, at 6%. Um, now, if you start making an extra $539 in repayments every month that you get from your granny flat, we've worked out, you're saving 13 years off your off your overall loan. So that's $328,000 just, just purely by adding a granny flat and using all the rental income from that, putting it onto your mortgage. Um, this is sorry, this is after that period where you've paid off your six years and now you've got just passive income. That's a pretty significant number right there. And obviously, if you want to add more, it's you know, it's, it's a whole principle of um, accumulated um, um somewhere there. Um, had a mental blank, but yeah, just so have sort of all accumulates. The more you put in, the quicker you pay it off. But again, we sort of when we educate people about this, it's um, it sort of shows them that yeah, just by adding that whatever you make in there, rather than put in your pocket, put onto your property, and you could save pay off your home loan a lot quicker. And much more. So with this, um, we have just purely because of the, our affiliation with Property Buyer, we do have an exclusive offer. So if everyone who's registered, if they were to sign up with us, um, we're offering sixteen thousand dollars worth of free upgrades to a granny flat. And you can sort of, sort of, sort of see there what we've what we've included and how we've come up with that sixteen thousand dollar value. It includes a you know free bench tops, stone bench tops, upgraded oven and cooktop, upgraded semi frame shower screens, an air conditioning system, vertical blinds. And more, and I say more there because there are a lot of little things like the mirrors and bits and pieces. But um, that's just an offer that we've um, agreed to um, offer anybody who's part of this uh, webinar. Now, what I want to do, Rich, um, we use an online planning portal which we subscribe to, and it's sort of real time. So it shows us, yeah, you know, the property. So if you put any address, we're able to put a granny flat on there and this is all to scale and work out what our setbacks are and just sort of see if it's permissible or not and just thinking if if you want to give an address where anybody in the audience wants to give an address i'm happy to bring it up as a sort of a live presentation and um see if yeah we can make something work mm. cool what, what we might do um uh, wally is there's a couple of questions um what we might do i might get people to put um in the chat you know i've also got people putting questions in the q a box but to do the free site assessment what i reckon we do is um 
come back to it. <clears throat> but if you would like a free site assessment, we can do a couple live. So just put yep. an address in the uh, in the chat and we'll come back to that in about 10, 15 minutes. Is that okay? Yeah. Yep. Sure, yep. Cool, cool. So, yeah. Um, and again, so like, like I mentioned before, it's very, very important that we do assess the site visually. Um, we often get people come to us, say, oh, we got a quote and the company just looked on Google and gave us a quote. I don't, personally, I don't think that's going to be accurate. Um, it's it's impossible mm -hmm. without being there to really understand the slope of the block. So we do offer free site assessments. It's costing you nothing and you're getting proper advice and a realistic quote of what it's going to cost you rather than just indicative um, by looking at Google. So mm -hmm. that's our email address there, Priority Client for Solutions, and you're likely to get booked in uh, for a site inspection pretty quickly. Fantastic. That's awesome. That's all I've got for now. Um, happy to pass over to you again, Rich. That's great. Well, look, um, as I said to everyone, a um, copy of your slides will be sent to everyone. Um, so maybe if you can just unshare and I'll just I'll just do my part of the presentation and then we'll okay. go to Q&A and then we'll go back to your site assessment screen and cool. we'll get some live examples going on that as well, Wally, which would be great. Excellent. So, um, yeah. Um, so we'll just do our slideshow, which I think is that one there. So hopefully it's working. Uh, actually, have I got the wrong screen? Which one have I I've got? The, is that presentation mode or is the main screen? That's no, you need to make it larger. Okay, wrong one. Yeah, sorry, I'll go the, go the right one this time. Screen two, which I think it should be this one. Screen two, yeah. There we go. I think I've got it now. How's that? Yep. Yeah, got the right one. There we you go. Got it. <laughs> Excellent. So yeah, just a little. I just like to add to uh, thank you, Wally, for your presentation. That was great. I think there's a lot, lot more you could talk about. I love your passion for design as well. So appreciate that. Um, I just want to cover off and sort of back up what Wally's saying with some examples and and just reiterate why I think um, branded flats are a good idea and also talk about the cons as well. Um, just by way of background, uh, for those that don't know me, I've been running Property Buyer for over 23 years. It'll be 24 years in October. Um, we've actually won 47 awards for Excellence Wally. I need to update that. We won a couple more awards the last couple of months, so <laughs> pretty proud of that with Pippa. Um, yeah, and I've been the uh, the president of uh, the Buyers Agent Association as well. Um, so a couple of things I just want to briefly talk about, why I think they work as an investment, talk about some case studies, and then talk about how to find uh, sites which have granny flat potential. So I hope that sounds good. So why do I think granny flats work well? Well, as, as you've indicated, Wally, they dramatically boost your yield. Um, you know, getting a much higher yield makes a lot of sense. Getting a positive cash flow investment, who wouldn't want one? You know, I'd be happy to have 20 of these in my portfolio if I could. Um, and as you've graphically demonstrated, the payback period is less than 10 years. Um, even if you've got a $250,000 granny flat, um, you definitely probably pay it back in, in around nine to 10 years. The other thing is it boosts your borrowing capacity. Banks love positive cash flow. Um, so it's a really, really great asset to have there. Um, it creates additional equity. Another thing is you're helping to solve the housing crisis because there's always really high demand for affordable rentals. You know, my granny flats have had virtually zero vacancy. As soon as one tenant moves out, someone else is there. They're very, very rare that they move on. Um, it's also a great way to, to exit. So if you ever did want to sell it, not that I recommend it, but if you ever did need to sell it, there should be a ready pool of buyers uh, wanting to get it. And as well indicated, if you go through CDC, Complying Development Consent, it's a nice, uh, fairly straightforward process as well and a much faster build time uh, than building a, a much larger home as well. So for all those reasons, I think it works quite well. How do you find opportunities? Well, a couple of things you need to do. Firstly, you've got to get your, your dollars and cents lined up. So talk to your bank or your broker about getting a pre-approval. Um, study Wally's notes, understand setbacks and, and size requirements, get that pre-assessment done through Grand Flat Solutions. And then you've got to get out there on your push bike searching every weekend, um, you know, creating short lists, visiting open homes, studying where properties that will, might fit your criteria. And you've got to create you know, strong relationships with local agents so you can jump on opportunities that come up. Because I know for a fact, being out there myself, it's very competitive, very, very competitive. So um, you can do the DIY approach or you can engage someone like ourselves to, to help you with that whole process. Then you've got to evaluate what to pay for the site. 
Um, now, a lot of vendors uh, are sort of building in the price potential, if you like, Wally at the moment. <laughs> They're really building in that, which is quite tricky. So you've got to make sure you're paying a fair price and not an inflated price uh, on the property. Then you've got to get your contracts exchanged, um, get your design um, process underway and your approvals in motion. So if you're going to do those seven steps, these are the same seven steps that we take for every client is, is to work out what kind of strategy um, that you need to adopt, what location you should be buying in, um, researching, selecting, evaluating. Um, the due diligence factor, I think, Wally, some people trip over and, and skip this bit. Um, you know, just, just because it does tick all the boxes with the SEP doesn't mean you can actually build one. There might be some practical considerations like, you know, uh, road resumption by the Roads and Maritime Authority, or there could be some subsidence if you're building around Newcastle, for example. Um, any number of other factors could come into play. So it's really important to do your, your, your due diligence before you commit to buying a property. Um, yeah, so they're the seven steps that we take all of our clients through in the, in the buying agent process. Um, why you might think about using a buyer's agent, um, I know some of you online are also current clients, but you've also experienced this, is, is really just a, a way to speed up uh, the process. It gives you co confidence that you're doing the right thing. You're following a roadmap based on a, on a clear buyer's brief. Um, we can give you access to opportunities that may not be advertised as well. Um, and my buyer's agents have excellent local knowledge, particularly all my buyer's agents live and work in their local areas. So they're able to give you some great, um, great insights into you know, pricing, what you're going to get as a rental return and what the end product might be worth at the end of the day. So it's really, uh, really boosting your confidence. And our average turnaround time from start to finish is about you know, one to two months. If you engage us to, to buying a property, average about 60 days. We have a six month agreement. There's no rush. Um, until we find the right property, but we're pretty efficient at finding good opportunities that tick the right boxes for our clients. Um, how do we charge? We work on a fixed fee structure. I'm happy to email that to anyone that's interested. Um, for example, a property at 650,000 or up to 700,000 is a flat fee of 14,200. You pay uh, 3,300 upfront and then the balance on exchange of contracts. And that gets us away um, and searching for a property. And one thing to note, Wally, like the market's been moving so fast in some areas, like in Brisbane at the moment, you know, we're seeing 10 to 12% increase in pricing per annum. So, you know, that's at least, you know, 1% a month uh, prices are going up. So, you know, if you wait, you know, three months, you've lost 3%. If you wait six months, you've lost 6%. So wow. using a buyer's agent really helps you get ahead of the curve um, we're also looking at doing this exact same strategy in Melbourne. There's a lot of areas in Melbourne now, as you identified, we can do this as well. And we can do it across Brisbane as well as Sydney. Um, I'd like to give just a couple of examples, just Wally, to reiterate a lot of the points you made before too. So um, these are some examples over the last two years that we've bought for a number of clients. And some of the yields have actually probably improved since we did some of these. Um, this is one we did in um, Western Sydney. Um, it's a, a property that already had a flat at the back, so we didn't need to build it, already had a flat in existence. Um, it was listed for 1.1. We managed to, to get it for a million and 75, um, but our appraisal was actually higher than what uh, the agent had quoted just based on comparable sales. Um, but the house is renting for 600, flat for 450, so yeah, just over a 5% yield, which is quite typical of a house and flat at the moment in Western Sydney. Another one we did um, just further southwest. Again, this was a home buyer. They wanted to have a flat in the backyard just to help pay off the, uh, the, the, the loan, as you've indicated one of those charts before. This was a more upmarket suburb. Um, again, uh, the, the granny flat was returning $500 a week. So that'll really help accelerate this particular first home buyers. Now, without the flat, this home buyer couldn't have achieved a $1.325 million purchase price. They had to get the flat income in order to qualify for the loan. So that was an important um, important opportunity. Um, this is actually one of mine, or it's gone a bit funny on the, the formatting there. Um, just an example of a property I bought on the Northern Beaches back in 2008. Uh, during the GFC, uh, I managed to snare quite a good deal on this one. I paid 850 grand, Wally, back then for this property. Wow. <laughs> and at the time, uh, I was getting $750 a week rent. Um, now, Today, um, oh, it didn't actually upgrade. 
Sorry about that. The, the formatting didn't quite work. Um, today it's worth 2.65. Um, I'm getting uh, 650 for the flat and 1,075 for the house. So, you know, if you look wow. at the actual ROI, I'm probably getting around a 10.5% yield on purchase price from what I originally purchased it at. Um, and uh, it's it's been a magnificent investment. So never had any problem renting it, walked to shops. It's been great. So great opportunity to buy and hold longer term. This one we just bought for end of last year for a client in Newcastle. Um, again, existing flat at the uh, the back of the the uh, the, the property. Um, <clears throat> more upmarket suburb, not far from Merriweather. Uh, paid one three four for this particular property. Again, got it under our appraisal range, uh, but it rents for twelve ninety three a week. I haven't actually done the calculation, but uh, actually the yield was there. It's just been um, covered over by the uh, uh, by the picture. Um, again, this is another one I did uh, bought about two years ago myself that you guys did for me, Wally. So thanks again yep. to your team. You can see, if you look at the photo, you can see the flat being constructed down the back of the driveway there. Um, so we uh, we bought this property in New Minor Beach. Um, now, Wally and his design team were very clever. Uh, we managed to make a three-bedroom granny flat because we converted the garage into a, a third bedroom, uh, which is a pretty smart way to go. So we're getting um, 5 dollars a week for the flat. And uh, we're getting 850 a week for the house. So a yield, total combined yield is just over 6.3%. Um, and we've really made a strong equity gain, gain over that period of time of 150K. So it just goes to prove that, you know, it's adding additional value um, to, to the overall property as well. Mm. Um, and well, we, oh, hang on, going the wrong way. Here are we. So the way we did, if you look at your lovely plan, Wally, that your design team did there, um, we, what we did was we got this lovely outdoor porch area, uh, which doesn't count toward the 60 square metres, right? It's only the, the habitable area under roof that counts to 60 square metres. Um, yeah, but after handover, we converted the garage into a, a living space. I put a, um, a little, just in front of the garage door there, I created a, a storage space of one and a half metres. So we had a roller door, and then we just put up another gyp rock wall, which cost me about 1500 bucks, and we converted that garage into a bedroom. And we had another ensuite at the back, which you can see here is called dog grooming. So that was a pretty smart way to uh, to get the second bathroom. So three bed, two bath. It's like a mini house, and it's what 90, 96 square meters under roof in total. So great outcome. And that you know a typical rental in that area for a two bed granny flat is probably about four ninety a week. So four fifty a week. So we're getting you know an extra one hundred and twenty, one hundred and thirty bucks a week more as a result of doing that little change. Um, another one we just bought uh, beginning of the year in Western suburbs. Uh, this already had a flat out the back. Um, the client's budget was up to 950 and we uh, found a nice one there, had a two bed, one bath flat, house rents for 550, flat for 450. So yeah, again, just over the, uh, just over almost a 6% yield um, for, a, for a house and flat in Western Sydney. Um, this is one we bought in, um, in Brisbane, um, in the Logan area. Um, it's got room for a granny flat, um, really good size block, 623 square metres. Um, doesn't have the flat yet, but it's something that the owner or the investor is going to look to, to put on there. So again, if you're looking at a price point where you can't afford Sydney, you know, Brisbane certainly offers some, some opportunities, as does Melbourne as well. Uh, another one we did in Brisbane with an existing flat in, in place. Uh, we managed to get an absolute bargain here for this particular client. Um, list price was 1.35. We picked it up for one million and forty. So massive saving. It was more of a, a motivated seller at the time. Um, and again, really strong yield, 6.1%. Client was buying in a self-managed super, uh, super fund. So really great opportunity to, to buy in, in the super fund. Mm. Um, that's probably enough examples, Wally, from me. Um, again, if you do have any questions or you'd like to think and consider engaging us, uh, all my details will be there on the slides and we'd certainly love to help you. So, Wally, we're going to, um, I'll just open it up for Q&A. Um, I'll just stop sharing that. And there's a bunch of questions. Can you see the Q&A there, Wally, on your screen? If you just click uh, on the Q&A button down the bottom. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to kick off with uh, Krishna's uh, question there, please? Can the uh, council reject a CDC approval? Um, no. So with, with CDCs, um, they're done by a private certifier and council really have no involvement in it whatsoever. So 
a certifier is really only going to approve something if it meets all the criteria. They're not going to do a dodgy and, and approve something that can't be done. So yeah, once it's approved, it's only the land environment court that can really overrule a CDC approval. So the answer is no, council can't do anything there. Can I be allowed to build a granny flat and a studio, 915 square meter block, existing house, 950 square meter and a car garage? So uh, yes, so you can build a granny flat and a, sec a detached studio as well. So studio is sort of non-habitable space. You can have a bathroom in there and like one big room. Um, but no kitchen or laundry facilities. But yeah, we've like numerous times we've built um, uh, granny flats and detached studios and even a garage. Yeah. So based, yeah, we'll have to look at the actual specific site to work at all the ratios of landscaping and everything else. But based on 915 square meter block and the house only being 150 square meters, it looks like there would be enough floor area to make that work. Um, do you need a flat space or a slightly sloping? Um, no, so it can be sloping. Um, that's where we look at, I mentioned before, about site costs and the cost to build. On sloping sites, there are more considerations. We might need uh, concrete drop edge beams or we might need retaining walls, additional drainage because of the slope of the land. So it, we can build on sloping sites, just got to uh, expect that it might cost a little bit more to do that. How does the ATA treat granny flats in relation to the principal place of residence? Um, so, okay, so I always suggest getting advice on this one. The If it's on your primary place of residence, if you're not renting it out, there should be no implications. If you are renting it out, though, and generating an income, then the ATA is probably going to look at that as an investment. It's still your primary place of residence, so but there could be that small percentage of capital gains payable if you ever sold that property because you were using it for investment purposes as well. But definitely get uh, speak to an accountant and get some advice or solicitor on that one. Can the roof of the granny flat turned into a storage area? Can a granny flat be used as an additional bed? Uh, can the uh, granny flat garage be used as additional bedroom? Um, the roof of the granny flat into a storage area? Uh, yes. So we are limited in height with our granny flats. So uh, as long as there's enough space in there, um, yeah. Like typically, they don't have really high pitched roofs because again, we're trying to meet the the height restrictions. Um, but yeah, if there's enough space in there, then yeah, definitely we can design it in a way where it's structurally sound. Can the Grand Flat Garage be used as an additional bedroom, as um, Rich would tell you? Um, yeah. Absolutely. Go for it. Yep. <laughs> once it's once we're gone, that could be, anything can happen. Um, Grand Flats built above a garage. Is there safety? Car with petrol when cooking in the kitchen can it cause accidents to petrol below. But good point. Um, it, it's a different class of building. So typically, if you're building above a garage, so you've got a class, like, without going too technical, like Grand Flat is a class one building, you're building above a class 10 building. So there are uh, requirements on fire rating and so on. Uh, so there are ways to combat that to make sure it's not a not a risk uh, with, with a vehicle below. Who is a private certifier? Uh, who, are, who are private certifiers? So private certifiers are registered practitioners. So they've, they've got the qualifications. So there's a qualification process you've got to go through to be become a, a certifier. Uh, typically, they have to have obviously building and construction knowledge because they're the ones that are doing the inspections during construction and signing off on it. Um, can uh, Green Flat Solutions certify as well as providers? No, so we're not certifiers. And in fact, it's illegal. It's a conflict of interest for us to be both certifiers and builders. So, no. Have Green Flat Solutions done any Green Flats in Geelong? I've recently seen seven units that look exactly like the piece while he provided. Um, no, unfortunately, not yet. Uh, it is a work in progress. We are working with people in Melbourne at the moment. And it's, you know, you can pretty much watch this space because we will be there. Um, it's probably more like six six months or so before we're up and running in Victoria. But yeah, those pictures I provide, none of them are from uh, Victoria. They're definitely all their own projects here in Sydney. And can you build two granny flats, a granny and grandpa? Um, <laughs> good question. <laughs> nice drive. But, yeah. <laughs> um, unfortunately not. The code is pretty specific where it does talk about one secondary dwelling per property. Uh, look, I mentioned before about doing studios as well. It's not habitable. You shouldn't be having a second occupant in there, but that's what some people do. It's it's their uh, their call. But yeah, legally, you're not supposed to have two granny flats on one property. Uh, the granny flat sale price, is it only the granny flat alone? What about the house attached to the granny flat? We're about to see this granny flat house for sale. Um, yeah, no, so when I talk about the, the sale price and just specifically talking about the green flat itself, if you were to attach it to a house, 
Um, and again, these are the types of things that we'll look at when we're on site, but um, we do have to fire rate that wall. So the separating wall between the grain flat and the house has to be built to withstand um, fire. So if there's ever a fire in the grain flat or a fire in the main house, that dividing wall between the two has got to be built to withstand that fire. Um, and we're about to see the grain flat house for sale. You probably want to speak to Rich about that. He's, he's the expert there. That's our game, mate. Absolutely. We'll have a chat. Um, yeah. Colin, there's a few um, addresses there. Do you want to share your screen and just maybe sure. do two, two, maybe three examples? Let's of do that. How you can right. locate a property. So we'll try number one, 12 Nerida Avenue, Mount Cola, and just work your magic and show us how you can assess sure. whether a site's feasible. Um, I'll just, while you're doing that, I'll just see if I can knock off a few more questions. Um, there was some here. You know, I'll try that. I won't tread on your toes. There's quite a few people asking. Yeah. Questions. Do you have recommendations for a Queensland-based granny flat company? Yes, that's for Gillian. Yeah, reach out and we can help you with that. Um, same in Melbourne uh, until Wally, until you're there. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, eventually. Uh, tax on rental income. Slides indicates no tax if paying off a mortgage. Da, 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 da. They work out clean cut as additional income. Sorry, just bear with me for one sec. I was bringing up the screen. Sure. I think um, the question for Emery, uh, what about tax on rental income? Absolutely. So if you're earning any income that you're earning, you've got to declare it for tax purposes. But it's really just showing you what would happen if you had additional income, how fast you can pay off a, a granny flat. Mm. Can you subdivide a granny flat later? Uh, typically, no, unless the minimum lot size is required. But I don't think that's really the idea of subdividing with granny flats. The idea is to have two the best idea with a, a granny flat strategy is to have a house and a flat on a non-subdivisible site. If you can subdivide a site, Wilson, you're better off to put a more substantial dwelling on it. Hmm. So you've got 12 Nerida up. Show us how it's done, Wally. Yep, all righty. So this is the property that was mentioned. So this is the program we use. It is called Can I Build? Um, it's a subscription-based um, software. So, okay. So they are two separate buildings. Okay. So based on this, we know it's an R2 zone. So it is permissible. Um, it's affected mm -hmm. by bushfire. It's in Hornsby Council. The width is roughly, these are not always exact, but um, it's an indicate, indicative. The frontage is 20 metres wide and it's 837 square metre block of land. So, Again, if I'll go back to that table I shared earlier, um, straight away we've ticked all the boxes in the sense that we've met the minimum frontage, we've met the minimum block size. It's an R2 zone, so so far so good. You can see that purple line across the front there. That shows us to the main sewer. So straight away we could sort of tell that the property sloping sort of towards the front. Um, now, again, without going too technical, blocks that slope to the front are typically better to work with. It generally means our stormwater is going to be easier to work with. We're not contending with main sewer lines. We have to encase in the backyard. So um, straight away, it's looking positive. And these lines here indicate the slope of the land. So what I'll do, so there are two trees there. It's hard to know just judging by this how large those trees are or whether they're native trees or not, but we will come to that. So what we do here is we just insert a granny flat. So we've um, uploaded a template of granny flats. They're all quite different, uh, different sizes and whatnot. Uh, and we use these purely for the for the purposes of um, just scale more than anything else, just to sort of see that's what a 60 square meter granny flat looks like in size compared to, compared to the property itself. Um, and again, you don't have to choose an L shape. This is purely just uh, for the purpose of this exercise. If I was to plonk this on here just let's just assume for now we'll do it this way so you're three meters off that back boundary there is that right yeah wow. yeah correct so that those dotted lines there so that dotted line there indicates a three meter setback and that dotted line there is our 900 millimeter setback there so i'm going to just assume that tree's out there for the time being you can see oh, i can move that across to there to give me some rough idea as soon as that turns red you can sort of see the edge of that green flag red it tells me I'm not complying, which means I'm outside of that 9 millimeter setback. But if I push that into there, just roughly there, you can see it's about one meter off the side there, uh, about three meters off the back. 
and about six meters from there to that garage. And again, this is not 100% accurate, but it's just indicative of about 11 meters there. So straight away, just by looking at that, I could see there's enough space. You've still got enough grass area all the way around. Obviously, there are lots of other designs. You could you could do like a long L shape across here. You could almost, again, depending on it, you could demolish that garage and, and bring a driveway right through and add a garage to the side of the grain flat as well. So yeah, this block, just by looking at that alone, seems to tick a lot of the boxes. We go into this table here. So it tells me every time you see a tick, it means it's it's complying. So we've met the land requirements, the lot areas, uh, acid sulfate, not affected by that. Now it says bowel and it's got a question mark here. So it is a bushfire affected site. Um, again, without going into too much detail, there are certain um, ratings where you still can build a granny flat if it's a low rating. If it gets really high, then that's not permissible. But these are the areas where we sort of need to go uh, dive a bit further, order documents and get advice on, on what's permissible or not. But otherwise, if you look at that, all our setbacks are complying um, and every other box is ticked. So generally, I would look at that as an initial inquiry and say, look, subject to the bushfire, I think it's possible. Um, the next step would be to engage with a bushfire consultant, work out what the ratings are and if it is possible or not. And if that ticks all the boxes up to this point, we don't charge anything, but this is just purely us uh, doing the investigation or due diligence. From that point, if you're interested, we would then come out, have a look at the site in more detail, take a few more measurements, have a look at those trees and sort of take it from that point on. All right, excellent. Do you want to do one more? Yeah, I'm happy to if yep. give me an address. Sure. Uh, try 21 Millwood Avenue, Chatswood West. Yeah. Like a nice bushy yeah. backyard with plenty of room there. Yeah. yeah. So the first thing that pops up is a C4 zone here. So a great example. Before I mentioned um, in certain areas, so grain flats are permissible. Everything seems to be okay here. The block size and everything, the width, block size. But it's a C4 zone. So this would automatically trigger a DA through council. So under the, um, the grain flats uh, requirement has to be a residential zone, R123 or RU5. Uh, if it's a C4, which is basically a conservation zone or an environmental zone, that has to be approved by council, in which case um, it's the council's discretion. I can say from experience we have worked with Willoughby Council and have had granny flats approved in Chatswood, which were conservation areas and which were um, uh, uh, gone through DA. And so I know it's potentially possible. We can't ever give guarantees when we're dealing with council because you just don't know who's looking after it, what's happening. But for the sake of this uh, exercise, I'll keep going anyway. Yeah, so again, once you see a lot of lines close to each other, that tells me that there's a bit of a slope on the block. So this is that type of block where um, if you were to build in this section here, it's probably going to have higher site costs than say that first one we looked at, again, purely based on the fact that there's a slope issue there. I didn't look at this in the first example we did before in Nerida Avenue, but... Um, Access is something we would look at. And again, sometimes it's hard to look at what's happening just from aerial maps, but there are some things we'd have to look at. It looks like there might be a street from here as to whether there's access or not. Again, we can we can have a look at that. If there is, that's going to help. But again, we'll just plonk a design on here for now. That one being wide, I'll just use a sort of a, a longer design. The good thing about this is it is all to scale, so you are getting a good indication of um, how much space there is. So again, I'll just put that on there. Put it to the corner for now. Just again, put it for the next size. So you can see straight away there are there is a bit of room around there. Being an environmental zone, C4 zone. One thing that does often come up is because they, because they are protected zones, removal of trees might be a little bit harder. So that looks like there are some trees. Can't tell if they're on the side or it looks like they might be on adjoining properties. That might just be the shading, which is good. But if you were trying to remove trees on a site like this, I think there'd be some objection from council, unless they were um, sort of weed or exempt type um, projects, um, species. Going through this, again, so 
as I said, it's showing as a C4. So straight away it's saying that it's um it, you know it's not an R123 or four, so it does need to go through DA. How long do you find tape councils DA for granny flats take on average? I often tell people not to scare them, but as an absolute worst case scenario, allow up to six months hmm. because it has happened. Um typically though, it, it's three to four month process. Where it can extend is like I mentioned before, if you get if you've got neighbors who just don't get along with, they're going to find every reason to object, even if it doesn't affect them at all. They're going to want to object. Yeah. And what happens when you do object or when a neighbor objects is councils do have to take that, um, listen to that complaint and respond to it. Often we get we hear complaints like, um, are they affecting my shadowing or affecting privacy or things like that? And then, you know, council asks us to respond and they also respond as well, so not respond, but mm-hmm. to give our view on that. And often you find because they are single story structures, they're so close to the ground it really doesn't pose any overshadowing and privacy is not usually an issue either because, you know, the windows are so um, not typically much higher than the fence height anyway. So yeah. privacy, they don't really come up as an issue, but you do get a lot of objections about that. People often say, oh, uh, car parking, we're adding more cars to the area and so on. The rules for granny flats are, are quite specific. It's that you don't need to provide any car parking for granny flats. Now, whether that's a good or a bad thing, the rules at the moment is you don't necessarily need to provide any car parking. So yep. when councils hear objections like that, they often will just respond and say, no, it's okay. Yeah, great. Cool. Everything else in this block, boxes are being ticked. So apart from the fact that it needs to go through DA. Yeah, uh, cool. It just seems doable. Excellent. Uh, well, we might just keep moving on. We won't do any more examples because we've got a bunch more other questions. I think we've proven the point about um, uh, slides there. So I think just to re- we'll come back here, someone's asking... Is 450 square metres the minimum block size? Yes, it is. Just go back to your table. Uh, is there a possibility of building more than 60 square metres? Um, so, so can we attach it? Okay. Um, depending on the area you're in, uh, I think I mentioned before, there are some councils that allow you to go a little bit more. Some councils will also say that the 60 square metres is taken from the inside of the wall, not from the outside. And what that means is effectively you add all those external walls that could add anywhere from four to eight square meters. So in some areas, you may actually get a slightly larger square uh, grain flat, but you'd have to go through a DA for that. Um, can you attach or extend it to the current property? Yes, the answer is yes, as long as there's no internal access between the, the house and the granny flat. Yep, cool. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, recommendations to Queensland Builder. We mentioned that. We can manage that one. Um, we talked about tax. A few more examples. Can you subdivide? We talked about that. Do you provide areas in Moreton Bay? Not yet, no. Oh, yeah. But again, we can do Queensland. We have a large patio in our backyard. You have to, would we have to remove it? Again, we just have to get you to do an analysis on your site. And that seems quite local, so we'd be happy to come yeah, Just around the corner from your office. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Uh, does the granny flat uh, have to be detached from the main house? Well, yes, they need to be separate dwellings, but they can be built quite close to each other. What's the? Is there like a minimum... Distance you need to build the flat from the main dwelling? Um, if you keep it 1.8 metres or more away, it's going to be cheaper because there's no fire rating and fire restrictions required. If you come any closer, so you can actually attach the two, mm. but that's where it starts to add a lot more cost and fire rating and so on. So, yeah, we always try to keep it separate just yep. purely based on cost. Yeah, cool. Uh, Vivek, interested to know more, just joined. Yes, we'll share the recording and happy to help you find a property, Vivek. Um, I have a granny flat with a brand new garage. We built granny flat garages to built together with the flat into Lexus. If I convert the garage to a bedroom, do I need approval? What do you think of that one, Wally? Um, going strictly by the code, the maximum grain flat area is 60 square metres and anything ancillary to that. So any porches, our fresco garages are not part of your 60 square metres. So some people do convert their garages into bedrooms. It's still approved as a two-bedroom grain flat, not as a three-bedroom. Um, do you need approval? Yes and no. <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of people just do it anyway, to be honest. Mm, yeah. Um, another one there, can you claim depreciation? Absolutely, 100%. Yeah. This is a really great benefit. Obviously, with brand new properties, you claim maximum depreciation. Uh, I recommend you get a depreciation company like um, BMT or Washington Brown to prepare a schedule for you. It costs you around six to $700 or more, and it's definitely worth it. Yeah. Do you recommend flat pack constructions? I only know I've only ever seen one, to be honest. Um, if you're very handy and you have all the trades and the skill sets to do it yourself, mm. yes. 
I'm not bagging them at all. It is a very different quality type build um, than than having it built conventionally. Mm. Um, I guess everyone's circumstances are quite different, but um, mm. I mean, obviously, when I, I look at, I can sort of tell that's a flat pack. It doesn't quite look the same, but again, it's not saying it's bad. It's yeah. I think just to that point, actually, one we should have made is that it's often good to build a granny flat to the specs of the area. So, as an example, if you're building something in Blacktown or St Mary's, um, are you going to use really expensive finishes and high end appliances versus something on the northern beaches that's you know going to be attracting a much higher rental? So you can build to the spec. I mean, even my experience, well, I thought I wanted to be brick all the way. I thought I want a brick granny flat. I want it to last. And then when you told me about the internal wall, you know, the cavity reducing the the total internal area by another three to four square meters with brick versus doing cladding, which is cheaper and more durable, I went, it's a no-brainer. So often just, as I say to everyone, listening to the expert advice of the designer can really help you make some mistakes down the track. Um, I'm interested in comparing the advantage of a granny flat now on an investment property in Wyonga versus waiting and doing a subdivision later. Uh, Tough question. I think you've just, for uh, Erwin, you've got to do an analysis of the resale value, what your exit strategy is going to be doing a subdivision. If you can do a subdivision, you're probably going to be better off to do a duplex. Uh, if it's too small, then you're probably better off to do a granny flat is the simple answer for that one. Do you build in Canberra? Money you should ask. We're at the moment negotiating on an office space in Canberra itself. So Excellent. answer is yes. Excellent. Fantastic. What's the maximum size granny flat? So again, 60 is your sort of um, based on a compliant development approval, 60 square metres. Like I said, certain councils have different rules, but you may be able to go slightly larger. Yeah, cool. Can you, can you build a granny flat in one go? Yes, you can. You can build a house in the flat either at the same time or you can build them separately. Yep. Uh, does it cost a lot more for approval fees when going outside CDC guidelines? Uh, as a rule of thumb, I'd say you're probably allowing up to about $10,000 more for a DA. That's mm. based on the um, yeah. fact that um, you still got the same consultant fees, but now you've got DA fees to add to that. Mm. And often councils will come back with additional reports yeah. and requirements that are not required for CDC. Yeah. So uh, as a guide, about $10,000 more, yeah. Okay, sweet. Uh, will CDC approve the garage conversion, as Rich mentioned? I think the answer to that one is simply um, CDC will tick off on what's built on the plans, but what you do after handover, if you want to change an internal wall or do something internally, um, it's up to you to do that at your own own risk, essentially. So it's not officially approved, but you can do whatever you want after handover. Um, there is a reserve surrounding our property, classified as environmental sensitive area. Can we skip going through DA? Again, I would just say to that person, just contact Wally, do an assessment, give the address, and you'll be able to know exactly where it is. How are the meters worked out? Gas, electricity, and water. How do you do that, Wally? Um, yeah, so uh, they can all be, we apply, we can, sorry, we can help you apply for all of those separate services. Um, and in most cases, yeah, when you are building a grand flat, you would apply for separate. So if you are renting it out separately, that is, you, you, and we can run them all and get them all ready for you. Yeah, I think it's really important uh, as a tip, if you're a good investor, to make sure you can get capture the, uh, the especially on the water meter, uh, it's better to have a separate, separate meter. Um, I see you do tiny homes. Can you have a granny flat and a tiny home? Yes, because a tiny home doesn't need approval. So the granny flat component will be approved and built and then you can park the tiny home anywhere really. So, yeah. Perfect. Okay. If you buy land, can you build granny flat first? Um, the short answer is no, only because the granny flat is considered to be secondary dwelling. So it has to be secondary to the main dwelling. However, mm-hmm. we've done this many, many times before. We've built the, call it a granny flat first, but called it the main residence. And then... Um, even made it just slightly, well, kept it at 60, maybe added a garage to it or something, so it looked more like a residence. Hmm. And then in the future, when they were ready to build, you apply for a change of use for a house and convert that house into a granny flat. So yeah. it can be done. Sure. Again, someone's asking, is it better to knock down and rebuild two properties, subdivide rather than having existing fibro? Again, you just have to do your own analysis as to whether the end value of having a subdivided block, which in my view is probably, if you can subdivide, I think you're better off to build a more substantial dwelling if you've got the funds versus just doing a flat. Do you go as far as Blackheath? Uh, Blue Mountains, yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Great. Excellent. Uh, if we build a granny flat with a new garage, build together. Oh, I've done that one already. Um, consequence, I've done that one already. Uh, difference in price between Vic Brick Veneer and Timber Clad. 
Yeah. So brick veneer adds roughly, depending on the size of it and how high your ceilings are and whatnot, about twelve to thirteen thousand dollars more for brick. Mm. I do often say, and it's funny that you mentioned that as well, Rich. With brick, you pay a little bit more. We actually get less floor area because the thickness of a brick veneer wall is a lot thicker than that of a cladded yeah. wall. Yeah. So you're paying more for it, but you're actually sacrificing the internal floor area. By that was exactly it. my case when I built my one. I didn't realize that until we sat down and talked about it. And then it was like, well, it was 10 or 15 grand more. And it was like, well, no, I don't want to pay more for a smaller dwelling. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, cool. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Great. Wally, we've exhausted our question time. Thank you so much. Um, we will be sending out as a set of recording to everybody along with the slides. And that will also have your contact details, Wally, and my contact details there. If you've got any other questions or you'd like to engage with our services, we'd be delighted to help you. Uh, but Wally, you're a font of knowledge. Thank you so much for sharing today with our audience and uh, we really appreciate it. Thanks, Rich. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks everyone for watching. We'll be back Thank again, not too distant future with more property buy topics. Bye for now. Thanks everyone.